Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I am said Eastern Forest. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for subscribing, if you haven't already, to the podcast. And for everyone who has given it a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, we do appreciate that. Thank you very much. This week, I have a conversation with Matthew Halsall, who is a musician, a producer, a trumpeteer, composer, and he's the founder of Gondwana Records as well. But he has a wonderful uh, new record called Salute to the Sun that uh, I just got into. I, I think I discovered him on Spotify a while back. And I was like, man, this reminds me of Alice Coltrane a bit, like spirit-infused modern jazz. It's just groovy. So you should check it out for sure, the music. But I just wanted to like learn more about who are you and how wh- how are you directing music in this direction? And he was gracious enough to come on board. And since then, I've discovered like his entire label, uh, Gondwana Records, is has a lot of amazing artists. Uh, Portico Quartet is on there. And he's also puts out various p- playlists that he keeps adding to that are equally amazing. So he, I think he's got one, I think it's called like Weekly Meditation or something like that. It, it's just all this music he likes. I think it's up to 24 hours. So I'll often just put that on, hit shuffle, and just continually discover new stuff. So I think you're going to enjoy this conversation a lot. It's about music and uh, the energy of music and creativity, and uh, you're going to dig it. Uh, I also just want to say thanks to everyone who has signed up to be part of the East Forest Council on Patreon. We continue the experiment. We had our first uh, monthly Zoom council. So that's one of the tiers of membership in the Patreon council. But I'm also shared uh, some bonus stuff from the podcast, a solo cast I recorded, I put over there, and some unreleased music. I got to share a track. So I'll continue to do more things like this, and I have some ideas for a couple live stream things that I'm going to do over on Patreon soon. So check it out. See if it speaks to you, and if you want to be part of this experiment of the East Forest Council, sort of a centralized space for us to connect and gather and and. Thank you also for that support. Uh, Eastforest.org. Just scroll down. You'll see the information there on the homepage or also patreon.com slash eastforest. I think since the last time I did the podcast last week, it was Eric L. and Matthew L., Rob H., Chuck R. E. signed up, um, maybe Gabriella, Jay, and and Dust, Deuce. That's one way to put your name. Deuce. Um Vishnu, Derek H., some of you guys I think were from the week before, but thank you so much for for being a part of it. I'm looking forward to continuing that experiment. And we're still trying to put those events together in different markets in the U.S., so we have a tour that you can sign up still via the Light Network. It's kind of like you pledge your interest in a particular city, and that helps us know if we can pull the trigger and get a venue and then sell hard tickets. So... If you'd like to check that out and, and see the some of the cities we're, we're looking at in the near future, that's also at eastforest.org slash tour. Uh, last other pieces of business, it looks like the East Forest Retreat in southern Utah, the one we're doing this fall, September 30th through October 3rd or 4th, whatever it is, it is sold out. But if you want to join the wait list, you can still do that. Just email team at eastforest.org. And we'll let you know if a spot opens up. And we're also exploring a few other retreat options in 2022. Hopefully we'll get back to Esalen. Uh, There's some possibility of something in Mexico. So we'll let you know. And I'm going to be going to Costa Rica for my first ever gig in over a year publicly in the world. And it's blowing my fucking mind that I'm going to be getting on a plane. And I'm doing a benefit for Fight for the Forgotten, Justin Wren's wonderful organization and uh that's where they're doing it and i said well you know if if we can make this happen i'd love to help and they're making it happen so kudos to them please uh wish me good fortune as i it it feels great it feels like insane to me to to get on a plane with equipment and then go play somewhere not just because of covid but like i just haven't it hasn't happened now and i was doing that so often and now it feels weird 
So I'm trying to be gentle with myself. I didn't expect the first excursion to be international, but I'm very grateful and and looking forward to just the opportunity to go and uh, doing everything I can to make it a safe, successful trip for everyone involved. So uh, thank you to uh, Brian and Justin and everyone who's helped make that uh, happen. I think it's the benefits happening just before Aubrey Marcus's fit for service thing they do down there. So, um, you know, it's related to Aubrey too. Thank you, Aubrey. Love to have him back on the show as well. I, 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 if you didn't catch Aubrey's episode about his darkness retreat and <laughs> check it out. And Justin Wren was recently on the show, which another amazing podcast. So, uh, dive in if you can. All right, friends, I'll have some news for you in the coming weeks about new music and releases coming out. Lots of wonderful stuff, but we'll keep it simple for now. Uh, I've got my head down into the creative spaces and I'm really enjoying spring sprunging, as it were. And just a little bit of a light at any tunnel that we continue to be swimming down. You know how it goes. But let's, let's get into this. Let's get into this great conversation with our dear friend, Matthew Halsall. Boom. Matthew ha- <laughs> Matthew ha- Halsall, right? That's how I'm supposed to say it. Hal. Hal- Halsall. Hal- Hal- uh, Halsall. Uh, Matthew Halsall. I know, I was just saying to you that I've, I've only read your name and listened to your music, so it sounds like I don't know who you are, but I feel like I know you a bit. Um, but then you get to this place of like, you know... I have to say it to the man himself. It makes me a bit nervous. I just like, I get very self-conscious about that. So I apologize. It's all good. Don't <laughs> worry. So you're coming to us from uh, the UK. And uh, I wanted to reach out to you, quick background, because, you know, like like a lot of people, I, I discover music on Spotify and it, it started to play some of your tracks and they definitely perked up my ears and I got into it. I was down in Southern Utah in my sauna a lot. And I just went on these deep dives and it was sort of casual. And then I was like, man, I'm really into this. You know, I'm into a lot of music, but I got really into uh, some of your work. And then you had a new record, Salute to the Sun, which I think is fantastic, by the way. Thank Uh, you. Cheers. Yeah. And so I just thought it'd be fun to reach out. It's one of the benefits of the podcast is... I get to, in a small way, amplify other people's work, but also get to to meet some folks. So great to meet you. Yeah, likewise. That's a... Thanks, man. So, can you tell us a bit about? Uh, I was I was digging into the record and what you've you've talked about it, and you described it as. Uh, would I is it right to say it's sort of spiritual jazz as a genre? Um, I'm not sure as a genre, but maybe from my perspective of who I am as an individual and, and the music I make uh, represents a lot of elements of my personality. And uh, when I was younger, I started studying uh, meditation and uh, yoga and Eastern philosophies, uh, even from the age of 14 years old. So um, it's, it's quite a, a, people describe my music as meditative and spiritual and kind of all sorts of things. So I guess, you know, it, there, there is a, a sort of new subgenre spiritual jazz that seems to be uh, dominating the kind of way of describing my music at the moment. So, yeah. I Who guess. else would you put in that like contemporary genre? Cause it's not a, a phrase I'd heard before and it's right up my alley. I, people say the same things about my music, but we make different kinds of music. So I'm really interested in like, what are those constituent parts that bring it together? Um, well, I, I guess it's music that has a kind of mellow meditative quality that um, is, you know, even things like the track titles and the kind of uh angle and character of the, of the person making the music is important so you know my first uh experience of what i would call spiritual jazz would obviously be john coltrane and uh, alice coltrane and pharaoh sanders uh, and you know john coltrane even named a track spiritual and the you know alice coltrane's album journey in Satchel and Ananda is all uh, about the sort of 
a spiritual meditative kind of journey and yeah. um you know people like Yusuf Latif and Don Cherry are very spiritual individuals um so they're the kind of old school teachers for me uh I guess more contemporary people would be uh, the likes of Dwight Tribble. Uh, there's a great band from London called Wildflower and another mm. uh, London band called Maisha. Um, there's also from Manchester, Nat Birchall. Um, and um, I could list, I have a, a actually a, a playlist on, on Spotify and Apple Music and uh, Deezer. Uh, and, and it's hopefully I'm going to keep putting it on other platforms as well i have to do it manually and only it's a bit of a slow process is, but, is that um, the one that's really long because i've listened to one that i think was like i don't know eight or 12 hours i went through the whole <laughs> thing over a week it's fantastic yeah I mean, it's called it, weekly meditations and that, that's i guess what i would class as spiritual mm. music meditative music and um yeah it's now i'll just check in now it's it's got uh 23 hours and 29 minutes of music. Uh, <laughs> well, so. you're almost there to a full day yeah <laughs> yeah 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 we, we're getting close and and i set that up actually at the beginning of lockdown as uh in fact maybe even before lockdown um as an as an idea of a place where people could people always ask me what are, what are my favorite uh, musicians and influences and this is a really nice way of just going here's 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 my world so yeah uh, yeah there's a cool breadth that you know dips into african sounds and there's you know, some latin sounds there's some contemporary there's some hip-hop and uh, influences in there if i the playlist i heard i don't know if it's the same one but there's one another one that's very long that i dug into that you made <laughs> is it yeah, the same there's one? also the uh i have a radio show on worldwide fm and uh that that features all the stuff that my record label is kind of into the sort of if you like it's the kind of office sound of the mm. record label what what we're kind of into um it's quite contemporary that playlist so yeah uh, whereas the weekly meditations is is anything from like the sort of 50s right through to present times so that's cool yeah there was a nina simone track on there that i hadn't heard before that was really cool i think baltimore or, yeah yeah so i mean there was there's some deep cuts in there that was unfamiliar to me um but going back you said that uh, you had a very early introduction in a sense to spirituality i mean I would assume that wasn't exactly normal at that time in, was it Manchester where you grew up as well? Yeah, it was, it was quite a, a very unique and special journey uh, for me. I, I had a quite a, uh, I had a really happy childhood. I, I'm very fond of my family and uh, it was great, but I really struggled with uh, education for some reason. I just didn't. Um, I, I I enjoyed meeting uh, the stu other students, and uh, I liked all the creative stuff, and I actually liked sport and the sort of physical exercise and education side of things. Um, but but I, for some reason, I didn't. I just didn't have a good a good journey through education, and and. Um, uh, was in my last two years of of what we have as called the GCSEs in, in yeah. England, and um, it was uh, time to maybe try something different because I really wasn't happy. So my mum's quite a spiritual uh, and creative, mellow character, um, and she read about this uh, school called the Maharishi School. Uh, where they did transcendental meditation and yoga before you started your studies and at the end of the day as well. And there was uh, lots of kind of classes in addition to uh, the sort of education system uh, where we would learn things like study Sanskrit and uh, wow. do lots of ch <laughs> uh, chanting and kind of uh, le read a lot about uh, ways of peaceful and positive ways of living life and healthy diets and all sorts of stuff. So it's kind of creative intelligence and uh, scientific kind of 
uh, conversations and stuff. It was it was great. It was a real deep place to go, and 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 the classes weren't very big. Uh, they were only ten people in a class, uh, so uh, it was mellow in that sense as well. Um, pretty much all the other students in my class were had been there since primary school so they've been there from a very early age uh little yodas little buddhas sorry? maybe <laughs> sorry were they like little buddhas you know if they've been doing that since <laughs> <laughs> um they they do you know what their their personality and and character and intelligence was incredible like uh i still i'm still good friends with all of them now and uh, they're really really special uh you know individuals uh and and they were really supportive and warm and welcoming um and they were they focused on celebrating a lot of the positive things in my life and making me feel better about those things um so they loved hearing about the music Uh, because when i was i started uh playing trumpet when i was six years old and i was touring i was getting paid for gigs by the time i was about 13 years old Um, And by the time I was 14, which is when I joined the school, I was actually touring a lot of the world, playing with big bands and stuff as as, um, a sort of young uh, featured artist within the big band. Um, So I I went to places like Australia and Kuala Lumpur and Singapore and uh, I went to Russia and I actually played in America in New Orleans at a jazz festival when I was 14 or 15. Wow. Is that, was um, it big band music? Yeah, it was, it was, um, you know, uh, kind of big band arrangements of, of famous kind of a lot of trumpet based stuff like Dizzy Gillespie arrangements and Miles Davis tunes and, uh, a lot of Art Blakey and kind of stuff that was like heavyweight kind of drum driven stuff um so it was a really good place to sort of learn a lot about music about the dynamics and uh the kind of musicians and culture around jazz um so uh yeah it was cool. did you when you were doing that were you guys playing kind of like bebop style too and do you feel like you have to get your fingers around that kind of stuff in order then to play the mellow soulful especially the ballads i think of like Miles Davis, you know, and how he started out uh, in in that era. Yeah, I mean, I I remember, certainly remember uh, playing, there's a Miles Davis tune called Four, uh, and I I memorized his solo and actually played it in a big band when I was, I think I was about 14 when I did that. Um, I think there's a recording of it somewhere, God knows where. But, um, and and so uh, that's quite a kind of boppy, uh, upbeat tune. Uh, I would practice a lot of Charlie Parker and Dizzy tunes, uh, and and studied quite a lot of that. It, with with big band music, a lot of the phrasing is quite boppy. Um, it's just kind of spread over loads of loads of instruments. So um, yeah, I guess I guess bebop was there, but I I was always drawn to them. was the sort of mellower side of jazz for some reason and um you know uh also other music like the beatles and rolling stones and uh kind of beach boys and stuff i liked all the sort of dreamy mellow mellow music uh, even in electronic music i like a lot of the, the chilled out stuff so I, it's just part of my personality but yeah, yeah. You mentioned Cinematic Orchestra and Aphex Twin, Boards of Canada. I mean, a lot of things. I also felt were influences to me as well. And but in a lot of ways, you know, I've, you hear about the challenges, like the way you weren't fitting into that school system, and it kind of led you. It was a bit of a gift in a way because it sounds like these early introductions to Eastern ideas and soulful ideas. I would imagine certainly influenced your music, but even though there's this natural momentum moving in that direction, um, I don't know how much you were playing and moving in that direction at that age, but would you say that was a pretty big foundation of like even your latest record? Yeah, I guess um, 
even on my new album salute to the sun the 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 title is essentially a nod to the the yoga that we were studying uh, at that early age was sun salutations um and then you know things like mindfulness meditations are really important gifts uh, that are still relevant and present in my life now but um i think uh there was a definite point where um i was meditating and studying all this brilliant philosophy uh, kind of maharishi transcendental meditation and philosophies of of his and and um there was this period where all of a sudden i was starting to discover that within jazz as well um when i first started out i didn't really know any of the sort of deeper spiritual 60s 70s stuff on impulse or strata east or black jazz but um when i was about when i was at the maharishi school i kind of started to become more and more curious on on kind of any music that featured things like tampora drones and sitars and uh, kind of indian flutes or eastern sounding flutes um, and i was actually also really into dj culture at this point um which was huge mm. in the uk in in the 90s um it was the late 90s dj's were bigger than live performers um he, yeah as a as a sort of musician you couldn't get a gig because every club was booked with a dj but um you know two of my favorite djs that were really important and influential were giles peterson and mr scruff uh, from manchester and giles from uh lives in london um and i used to listen to giles peterson's show on radio one um which was called the worldwide show which was brilliant really eclectic mix of music and mr scruff was the same and i I used to go to his club nights my friend's parents uh from the maharishi school actually were big fans of mr scruff and and started taking us there um uh, as early as we possibly could get in basically um which was amazing like they were they were two of the coolest parents i've ever met uh really progressive and kind of I became really good friends with them and their, their son, who um, is still one of my best friends, uh, Will Curley and his parents. Um, um, we learned a lot together, you know, through that, that whole journey of DJ culture, uh, going to clubs and listening to people. A lot of American DJs really inspired me in a different way, like uh, brought me into the kind of uh maybe you know, detroit house and electro and techno stuff mm-hmm. I, I kind of found that really interesting as well um and and really deep and soulful like you know it wasn't commercial uh electronic music this was something with a identity and a feeling to it and a personality and i think that's what i get excited about with uh, i'm not so um concerned about you know being part of a certain genre or kind of movement um or as a listener kind of that stuff doesn't convince me it's more what excites me and makes me want to be a musician is personalities and characters um within music and and the hardest bit as a creative is is trying to get your personality into into the music but some other people i've named in the past you know miles davis is certainly a character and john coltrane's a deep character and um even aphex twin and uh mm-hmm. you know people like that very interesting characters um people like bjork as well um so it's it's kind of i think i definitely get excited more about the whole experience and the journey and the connection with the individual but, how do you convey that when you're putting together a band and it's a group of players and there's definitely, you're, you're able to translate, you know, the kind of energy you want to come out in the music. So how do you actually try to get that to them uh, in a musical language? Well, I mean, uh, the, as a composer, this is sort of long personal process of writing where you, you sort of sat at home either at the piano or using software or playing instruments and recording and and you sort of write the main theme and 
feeling of the tune um and then that's the beginning and the end of the tunes uh, in, in my comp compositions in general and then you uh you show them the band and you you have a quite a long chat and and kind of go through the sound and the direction of the recordings you want to do tell them what how to play to a certain level without restricting them to the point where they're not having fun so i would say that it's more a case of like for drums and percussion uh what ride cymbal to use and you know the certain mm. sounds of the snare drum or the kind of percussive bells or whether to use congas or something like that um and then you obviously talk to the rest of the band about the sort of solos and the kind of ups and downs and sort of dynamics of the track that you want um but most of it's you know when you've got fantastic musicians uh working with you that are that actually care about the music that you're making and kind of feel a part of that journey they 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 do stuff that i could never explain as well um, yeah and, yeah and you 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 get into a a creative space that is almost like psychic like uh, everyone's reading each other's minds and kind of in a beautiful kind of state of creativity like um totally man yeah and for you when you feel like you're in that flow or in that pocket of the feeling you're trying to get that personality or that depth you're looking for personally is is, is there any connection or 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 through line to those meditative states for you like what is that how do you feel when you feel like you're in that spot and is there a connection to meditation there's definitely a, a con when when you do uh group meditation uh it's a very similar experience to when you're performing with a bunch of musicians and you're all um, right. connected to one focus. It's like a group mindfulness exercise where everyone is concentrating on the same thing and everyone's having a conversation, but without using words and um, kind of they're expressing yeah. themselves on their, on their instruments. It's a, really powerful deep feeling like when i when i'm on on stage performing i often just close my eyes and really just listen to the musicians and 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 i have a real deep meditative feeling when i'm in that in that headspace with with those musicians it's it's quite a magical thing and that, i guess that's the beautiful thing about jazz music it's quite a unique art form uh where it's it's not a it's kind of very every time you're performing together it's it's got a different energy and it's, it's alive a very, yeah a, it's... a moment and a live energy yeah that is that is really special yeah i i listen to all kinds of music and i feel that the music that i make i make because that's sort of like in some ways, what comes out the most naturally, but it's also what I'm able to make. You know, <laughs> there's an issue of limitations and chops. And, uh, but to me, I'll, you know, jazz music with the, not just the harmonic f complexities and, and sort of options you have there, but this notion of the improvisational aspect and the conversation, it feels like one of the most evolved forms of music that we, we have. And I'm a lover of all types and i don't really put in the time to try to become what i would consider a great jazz musician you know but someone like keith jarrett is a huge influence on me but he's the kind of guy also that literally could do anything anything and uh mm. but there's some there's a it just has this, this level of, of freedom of conversation and uh I feel like that's that's really special. You hear it in other music for sure, but in jazz, it, it's often baked in as part of the structure. Yeah, I guess I guess um, you know the uh, uh, jazz music is uh, quite a complex language um, that you know people are st study. Well, there's certain 
degrees of kind of jazz um and and you can go as far as this is it's probably the most expansive uh genre there is because the possibilities are so endless with with scales and kind of the way you interact with each other and the instrumentation you use and you know there's no real rules uh, there's no you can play every single day in a different way and if if you're angry you could play really heavy angry stuff um but you know i, I guess yeah it's it it depends what your desire is as a i i also yeah. think of musicians and and jazz and uh, you know you're having conversations and i think the audience is really important as well um and being able to in make not get too self-indulged in a con in a kind of conversation with the musicians on stage and forget about the listener um i think i think that's really important because it's it's not just the musicians in the room it's the it's every everyone that is you know when someone puts on one of my records they're listening to it on their own or with their friends and it kind of I think that there's an importance for them to feel uh, an inclusion in the in, in the way they listen and, and a really careful kind of clear message. Um, but it's hard yeah. to explain. But no, I I vibe that. That's a great point. Like there is something very different about when there's just even one listener and you're performing anything. It changes things, and there's a conversation happening, and I. I'm wondering if you bring that into the studio at all. Like when you have a group of musicians and you're recording the album, do you try to think of ways to keep that energy alive of sort of like the witness or an audience in a sense, if it's not a live recording, meaning not recorded at a concert? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, we just record a lot. Um, we record every week now. Um, I built my own studio and... Um, we've got a really relaxed setup and and kind of uh approach with it all where we we meet up every wednesday and you know everyone records we're in separate rooms but we all have really nice headphone mixes and um the the communication we've got really used to that that setup and that kind of approach and the nice thing with that as well is you know if if you kind of trying to do something challenging and kind of different, um, you know, and someone doesn't fully connect with that because you're recording with the isolation, you can take things out. Yeah. The funny thing is I always say that to relax the musicians and, and sort of say, don't worry, you know, if, if you just play and see how you feel and how you connect with it. And if, if it's not right, we can take it out. But I very rarely end up needing to take, anything away from the music because people feel relaxed and end up playing really nice um solos and kind of uh, additional parts on the music but um it's it it i think i think you have to pick the right musicians i spent a lot of time finding musicians that had a certain personality that was in some ways similar to mine um and and in other ways would add the things that my personality was missing. So mm-hmm. one of the things Miles Davis always did was like get a horn player that played all the kind of heavier, faster stuff. So he could kind of drop it down and play really mellow. And I'm, I'm definitely a mellow trumpet player. And, and, and I like having sax players and flute players that can kind of play in a slightly different way and add a different energy and by the same token like the the piano player i often like the piano to be really quite a energized and elevating solo instrument and and then the the harp to be the opposite to be the kind of mellow antidote to the uh record and music so um so yeah it's it's just just about uh, there's so many different things that um happen but when you get the right musicians and they start playing together it's it it is amazing totally man 
And I've heard directors of movies say like, you know, what's the key to a great movie? It's like great casting. <laughs> you know, like, how do you get great acting? Get great actors. Like, you know, they, they do most of the work just by bringing themselves to the project. Uh, I want to ask you about the percussion sound too, because I've heard this term like tropical percussion that you used. And I'm definitely hearing a lot of inventiveness in thinking outside the, the traditional drum kit. And it does bring, it changes things dramatically when you start adding those textures, both rhythmically, but more the sonic of it. Uh, is that just something you like to play with and have fun with? Or is there a, a particular palette you like to work with? So on, on the new album, Salute to the Sun, the main idea I had was to uh, create a sort of um, a tropical and mellow a uh, sun-drenched zone for the listener. So when you put your headphones on, you uh, escape into this nice place. Um, uh, as a writer, I think that, uh, you know, music can really, it can take you to to so many different places. It, it can create an atmosphere, it can create an energy and a mood, um, and it can, it can be a great escape from reality. Uh, I love sitting at the piano with my headphones on or kind of keyboards or whatever and just shutting my eyes and and trying to imagine a different space uh to live in mm. and be in. Um and and on this record I was the other thing that I I found myself really enjoying was um when I was composing listening to um ambient field recordings of like uh, jungles and rainforests <laughs> no um, shit I, it's a new world for me I, I, some people do it some people listen to them just to get to sleep at night but uh i was enjoying composing and kind of being creative over the top of them and then those those sounds of the you, you know on youtube and places you can you can get like two or three hour long sessions of ambient field recordings it's, it's quite quite good fun just to sort of going through them and listening and and when you when you're listening and start in this different dimension you sort of start hearing different instruments on your music and and this is a bit like if i was sat on a beach somewhere uh, you know i'd probably write very different music to a so it so it took me to this place so uh, and, and i was trying to recreate sounds of nature and, and rainforests within the percussion and the sort of drums and different instruments within the music. Uh, so I would talk to the band about this idea of like, how can we kind of capture this, this, I'd play them a field recording and then say what, you know, I want you to play in this sort of, uh, ambient sort of landscapey way. Um, and uh, we managed to get there. We managed to get some some sort of sound and feel to the record that's quite fresh and different to my other records. It's, uh, Definitely, the percussionist was he, he was amazing. The percussionist he sort of sent. He's got a couple of uh, um, people that make percussion all over the world, and he was ordering like these giant clumps of like seeds and shells and. Um, you know, different types of chimes from all over the world and um, uh, these big, beautiful clumps of Indian bells and stuff. Uh, it was it was quite... It, it, he actually inspired me. Behind behind me right now in my studio, I've, I've got a, a big rack of kind of percussion that you can't really see, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's kind of... Um, it's great. I, I love those those sounds, those extra textures and kind of feelings that you can put into music without necessarily interfering with the melodic movement. Um, so, so uh, yeah, we went on a mad journey trying to create stuff uh, that sounded like a rainforest, which sounds a bit weird until you listen to the record. Yeah, it sounds great. It's cool because I also, I mess with field recordings a lot and I, I record them myself but I actually end up putting them into the music a lot. And I'm just curious if you ever thought about, you know, you're representing the energy of that and, and translating it into the music. Did you ever consider actually bringing in those field recordings or have you? Um, I did consider it a lot, actually. Um, um, it was kind of, it was, it was touch and go uh, whether to keep them on or not. But uh, I decided to take them off because I thought, 
in some ways it makes it more unusual and exotic by taking them off because you kind of their purpose was to inspire and create this atmosphere for us as, as, as the musicians, but not necessarily to distract the listener um, from the musicians and their performance. So, so I, I quite liked this idea of like, as a sort of um, referencing and kind of being inspired and kind of living in this world. It's a, it's a bit like, I guess, the, the closest thing we could do without, any you know big financial budgets for recording to, to send in the band to a tropical island and record in <laughs> in, in some sort of paradise uh, the 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 cheapest alternative uh, to to do this in manchester was to sit and listen to some exotic yeah. sounds you say you can close your eyes yeah. and pretend you're on the beach or you can go to the beach but we're, we're gonna we're gonna just listen we're gonna meditate yeah. our way there uh that's cool man yeah well i think you did a good job of interpreting that and using it as an influence and actually sort of not just a loose influence, but like sort of actually bringing in largely through the percussion. I thought the, the sounds, you know, translating those sounds and then it overall, you're, you're definitely bringing in some kind of energy that's gluing it together. And I mean, was that kind of like the musical North star of it, if there was one, or could you say there was something that glued it like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, a lot of my albums, the, the, there is a, a sort of a theme or a direction uh, to the music. Uh, they, they, they often represent places. Um, each record sort of captures a certain place for me or a time in my life. Um, uh, so uh, when I was making, one of my records is called Fletcher Moss Park, and that album was composed entirely in the park uh, i was i was sat in a beautiful uh, springtime period just writing on my laptop in the park um, and and then i took that music to the band and explained where i'd recorded it and how i wanted it to sound and uh, it often gives you a really nice kind of more relaxed approach to making jazz music when there's a bit more of a a direction and a concept uh sometimes there's more pressure if you kind of suddenly like right we have to do the most amazing jazz album but actually what i'm asking the musicians to do is is to create something more atmospheric and kind of connected to a certain place um uh, the album on the go uh, that i recorded was me imagining that i was in a sort of 1960s Paris, uh, sort of black and white film noir kind of uh, feel to it. Um, very inspired by things like Miles's Lift to the Scaffold and all the yeah. uh, Parisian jazz compilations that I, I sort of had collected over the years. And so so e each one sort of, I, when I'm composing, I'm, I'm sort of trying to take myself into a different sort of, world and i like a uh, feeling uh escapism uh which which seems to really appeal to um, uh, my fans as well they sort of often talk to me about that stuff so yeah uh, dig it so what what are you feeling is the next evolution for for jazz or do you care <laughs> or do you feel like as far as its relevancy it's been through an interesting journey the last few decades where sometimes i feel like i wonder if it's trying to find its its place because it's its evolution was so at least looking back it, it, it was very strong you know from the beginning of the century uh through to maybe the end of the 70s uh where do you see it now and where it's moving i guess uh you could say that about most genres um they're, they're sort of um because of the possibilities now with with education and listening and recording and uh everything's opened up uh in a really kind of inclusive way um and i think that 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 jazz will continue to mean and fit, be a lot of different things to a lot of different people it, it's kind of 
I I really like from a record label perspective. I've I've been fascinated with the idea of crossover within music. So mm. uh, a lot of my a lot of the artists on our label seem to cross between, you know, maybe neoclassical music and ambient and electronic music and uh, right up my alley. Yeah. Pardon? I said it's right up my alley. Yeah, it's yeah. it's kind of. We have a lot of bands like uh, Gogo Go Penguin and Mammal Hands and uh, Han Yarani, a Polish piano player, and Portico Quartet. And they're all like really quite progressive and kind of forward moving with their music. And then and then there's people like myself on the label, obviously. Um, and, and mine's sort of a, both a connection to the past, but also trying to do my own thing and s- take people on on my own journey um and and i think that there's nothing wrong with like sometimes i really like it when someone makes a super retro sounding record uh, because it actually sounds really fresh now to hear hear that because there's so many people that have got really engrossed in technology and um and also i I think there's a demand for like from a live perspective you know People never got, my generation never got to see Alice Coltrane uh, or, you know, occasionally Ferris Sanders might come to the UK. Uh, I've seen him about six times, uh, luckily, but, um, wow. you know, it's getting less and less likely for him to yeah. be able to tour. So, so rather than starve that um, kind of uh, world and that, that kind of fan base, um having younger generations playing, um, you know, music influenced by that is not a bad thing. Um, but, it, you know, everyone's got a different maybe feeling about about the journey of jazz. And I'm sure there's some purists out there that would say some music isn't jazz or some music <laughs> isn't technical enough to be worthy of the, you know, jazz great title or whatever. But, um, uh, you know, I'm quite a mellow, inclusive person and kind of feel like, you know, I want to support and kind of listen to lots of different types of jazz. So, Portico Quartet, uh, was Nick, are you know Nick Mulvey back when he was part of the group? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Nick, I met Nick Portico and... Quartet um, before they even had a record deal. Um, uh, my friend invited me down to uh, London, well, I was in London. They they invited me down to a a gig that Portico Quartet were doing, which was just a busking gig on the South Bank uh, South mm-hmm. Bank uh, in London. And I, I sat and listened to them play for about two hours, uh, and I was totally blown away by their sound, uh, having a hang drum, and just even the way they they wrote music and how melodic and uh, different it was to anything else I'd heard. Um, and Nick was in the band then, and um, I became really good friends with them and actually said on the South Bank, I bought their CD because they'd made their own CD at that point. But uh, when I said if I had a record deal, re- record label, I would sign sign you, uh, but uh, I didn't have one then. And um, 10 years later, I did, and uh-huh. they were looking for the right label and knew that I was a fan. So That's cool. Yeah, I crossed paths with Nick a year or two ago and we ended up doing a track together for one of our releases and uh he's a great guy i really like his music and um he's been on the podcast too so it's oh, yeah cool. a lot of the folks on the label are making some really wonderful music and a lot of crossover with our worlds too so um are you feeling good about sort of like the future of of labels and the role like independent labels are playing as as the music industry continues to evolve in this wild west digital ecosphere um yeah i mean uh, my label's really uh you know it's set up by a musician and it's for musicians um it's not a not a greedy corporate monster um you know we do everything super straight 50 50 kind of vibes with with uh, our artists and and want to support and encourage them and challenge them to be the best possible band or artist or musician they can be um and 
I, I set up the record label because there wasn't that many labels that sort of represented the music or personality that I had as an individual. So it's nice to be able to support, support uh, kindred spirits uh, that are coming through and um, give them opportunities uh, to record and work in ways that I didn't get when I was younger. Um, I started the record label with just like a thousand pounds and managed to convince a couple of great Manchester musicians to s record with me and 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 uh, an engineer to to uh, use his gear to um, do a couple of days of recording and you know that first release did really well as a as a sort of DIY kind of start out record uh got a lot of support from giles peterson and stuart mcconey and people in the uk and and really grew uh my artist profile uh and and then you know we kept building and and the label now financially is really really in a mega healthy place and we Wonderful. can kind of do whatever we want but we're still not just going to sign everything and anything it's about finding stuff that we really really genuinely have a connection and care about and want to support um so but i think the indie label business is is okay i think i think uh we're definitely giving the corporates a good run for their money now um and challenging <laughs> them uh so uh we just have to see um cool yeah, it's 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 a really wonderful collection that uh, it speaks to a common thread that speaks to me too. So great, great on you for doing that, and um, I love the the breadth that's on there, but also like the I don't know. There, there's a there's something you're holding on to as as that north star we're kind of talking about musically that you definitely can hear, and it makes the musical landscape out there richer. So thank you, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, you've got a, a great record. I hope people can hear it. And it's been wonderful to get to connect with you. What's the best way for people to drop into your world? Um, I guess uh, the record label website, uh, gondwanarecords.com. Uh, also my own uh, website, matthewholesall.com. Uh, I'm on all the social platforms and... We have lots of nice playlists. There's, there's a on Inst, uh, sorry, not on Instagram, on uh, Spotify. We have a Gondwana Records profile, um, and there's links to lots of eclectic and interesting playlists that myself and other artists have put up, put together. Um, uh, and there's the Worldwide FM show. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's all on there on socials and, and a lot of the bands and stuff will be doing live shows uh, um, hopefully in the autumn again um, and also live streams so keep your eyes peeled for that I guess yeah yeah all right Matthew thank you very much I hope to catch up another time soon uh, it's been a pleasure thanks for your time cheers Thank you, Matthew, for coming on the show. Definitely check out his music. Uh, Matthew is M-A-T-T-E, sorry, M-A-T-T-H-E-W. Halsall is H-A-L-S-A-L-L. -L. The link is in the show notes down there. And this track you're hearing in the background is called Harmony with Nature. And it is from his new record. So, man, as I said, it's a wonderful world and... Uh, got great vibes and i think you will enjoy it thanks again for reviewing the podcast for sharing the podcast and for saying hi on social media and otherwise you can always hit us up at info at eastforest.org and thanks for everyone who's signing up and checking out the east forest council on patreon i love this experiment together and i'm, I'm continuing to see where it can go and i appreciate your participation check it out patreon.com slash eastforest or eastforest.org and just scroll down and you shall see the Patreon information about the council. Well, more to come, friends. Uh, I'm going to try and I'm going to take a walk today outside. It is a beautiful day. I have been working super hard on many things. I know that is vague, but it's important to balance it out with 
some uh, some time in nature to fill up the well, as it were. And I'm gonna go do that. My dog is in town. And boy, am I grateful to have Kaya, my OG guru, with me for a few weeks. And I am just spoiling her to death. So I'm going to get her outside, which gets me outside. Because really, who's walking the dog anyway? Who's walking who? Keep walking your walk, folks. Don't take any shit, but if you do, grab a dog. Do it with grace.